perspective of that, I'm joined in studio by Abel Oyeyo, uh, who's still my friend. We're no foes. He's a researcher at the Center for African Progress, also political affairs commentator. Many thanks for making time. Thank you. Thank Always you a so pleasure much. to have you with us. Now, um, let's start with monitoring what's happening in Sudan. I'm keen to know your take on the political developments. Um, we saw the military transitional council take over after um, al-Bashir was overthrown from power. Now, the civilian transitional um, dream, is it possible, um, bearing in mind that you know the military has had control in this particular country ever since its inception, I mean? Well, I think uh, transition to civilian rule is likely to take place. But again, that's going to be very much dependent on the kind of attention the rest of Africa and indeed the rest of the world gives to what's going on in, in Sudan. Obviously, because of the culture of military uh, rule that has been there for a long time, the generals will be tempted to cling to power, of course. But I think there is sufficient pressure so far to hand over power to uh, civilians. And I think uh, what should be given is some kind of timeline so that, you know, they're told in a year two, make sure power, you know, transitions to to civilian rule. Mm -hmm. I yeah. think the AU came clear, um, giving the military council a limited amount of time. Was it three months, if I'm not wrong? Three months, uh, yes. Three months to, uh, for transition process. But the goal of this demonstrations was to actually get a civilian um, democratically elected, you know, leadership right there uh, to lead the country. Um, I don't know about the stand of the African Union, bearing in mind um, the links that President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi has to the military in his particular country. He's a military man. Yeah, so yeah, um, what do you exactly mean by the stand of African Union? Because they might seem to, you know, stand with um, those who are pushing for the military council to step down. But in retrospect, the man who's leading came to power through um, the strength of the military. Well, I, I, um, I'm talking about, you know, the active participation of African heads of state and government, especially the ones who've been elected in a, a democratic way, you know, civilian leaders. Of course, you cannot expect uh, the president of, you know, Egypt to, uh, to move in and try to push against, you know, the same, same guys uh, he, he identifies with. So I expect uh, heads of state and government, who are members of the EU, of course, to move in and push for genuine transition from military rule to civilian what, rule. And uh, they don't have to listen to the guidelines of uh, the president of Egypt. I think what the people of Sudan have achieved is so, so, so big because it's been so long, you know, they've fought for, so, for such a long time. And Bashir was such a strong man. Definitely. So the support I'm talking about has to come from both the AU in terms of its leadership and African countries. You know, uh, I think you understand the role of social, social media mm -hmm. in uh, what we've, we, we've seen happen in so many parts of the world, the Arab Spring and all that. So, you know, we have to support that. And it's not just the AU. It has to extend beyond the conference of the African continent. All I right. expect the Americans, Britons and the rest of the world to indeed push for genuine transition from military rule to uh, civil, uh, civilian rule. Yeah, okay. And it can happen. All they have to do is to make sure they continue applying pressure and monitoring what's going on there. So in short, yeah. no retreat, no surrender. That is it. All right. Now yeah. let's cross over to a country which seemed to think about offering the besieged president, um, that is al-Bashir, you know, uh, some sort of leniency. You know, you can come to Uganda, yeah. um, the president might consider it. Now, let's focus on Uganda right now, not because of the president who's led since 1986, but a recent move that, you know, might revamp their tourism sector. They recently launched two aircrafts to revive the Uganda Airlines, which had, you know, gone down. Yeah. What, what do you think about this move in opening up East Africa to the world? I think that is a good thing for, you know, uh, the country itself. Uh, we're talking about two aircraft. That's a very small number. Yes, yes. So still, I don't see any serious competition to KQ. I know KQ is not doing very well because of our, our problems in terms of management and, you know, finances. But KQ is still so far ahead. So I don't think they have anything to be concerned of. But then again, competition is always good. That is how you get quality. And uh, for the sake of the East African community, I think we'd like to see everyone move up. So it's good. So KQ shouldn't be scared of competition because there is no genuine competition. But again, it's good. 
In what? short, President Yoweri Kaguta Museveni walked the talk. He promised um, while he was campaigning that he would revamp Uganda Airlines in whatever form, even if it's two aircrafts, yes. that he has done. And what does this mean as Uganda perhaps gears up for the 2021 elections? We've seen Bobby Wine um, claim he's under house arrest. He had a concert the other day and he was barred from accessing, you know, that particular parcel of land, yeah. which belongs to him yeah. um, for that particular concert. So so will we notice um, perhaps a change in the in the castigation of President Yoweri Kaguta Museveni, especially among the youth? Well, I don't expect that to change. Uh, obviously, you know, Ugandans are so, so, so uh, disoriented, it is a franchise. They, they don't appreciate what's going on. But then again, like I've said before here, which of course, of course has not been taken so well, Uganda, I mean, uh, Museveni is a strong man, he's a dictator. And uh, you expect him to obviously be a top contender in 2021 and uh, the mistreatment of Bobby Wine is likely to go on I don't get so much excited like most people when it comes to Bobby Wine mm -hmm. I don't think he has the intellectual capacity to lead Uganda to any you know potential position but again he excites he captures the imagination of young people in terms of leadership but it, I don't think he has what it takes but uh, let's borrow from Long time opposition um, for, you know, um, that's Dr. Kiza Besije, is still supposed to be in the ballot. Is this a case of divide and conquer, perhaps? Because we have now two perceived strong opposition against, leaders against, against the strong. Well, you can say that, but I don't think, uh, I think Bobby Wine is uh, an independent person. He's been able to rise, of course, buoyed by the support of young people. Again, um, Ukraine is a very different story. Zelensky is a very bright man, yeah. of course. It's not just about comedy. Perhaps also, Russia has a part in it. Uh, I, I don't think so. I think, you know, Ukrainians have so much. Uh, they've gone through so much. They've okay. lost so many people. I think 13,000 13, 13, yeah, since, of course, um, the war began. Yeah. So I think they're so disenchanted. They said, okay, now, if politicians cannot help us, let's go for someone else. Okay. And, of course, he said, I'm not going to let you down, and I hope he does not. So for Bobby Wine, it's different. Uh, his uh, background in music, of course, is good for young people. But I don't think he has what it takes to be Uganda's president. Dr. Besage is okay. But I, the, the whole thing is they don't have a chance. They don't stand a chance in 2021. So I think the only way Museveni is going to be ushered out of power is by death. Because Ugandans have not been excited enough to give us what you've seen in Sudan, Sudan. and maybe Libya. If it gets to that point, then you can say these guys have a chance of you know giving new direction in uganda until then so far it's not happening and then we have the problem of support from the african union and other african heads of state and government they don't tell these guys hey it's time to do what to get out yeah. they keep on supporting them that's why they're going to be around for as long as possible it's unfortunate for the people of uganda and of course east africa and Africa as a continent. Speaking of East Africa, let's focus on Kenya right now. And of course, not much criticism this time round, but President Uhuru Kenyatta, as well as African Union Special Representative for Infrastructure, have headed to China, China. you know, the Belt and Road Initiative. Of course, a couple of critics have, have come against Raila Odinga, mentioning that um, initially he was against you know the standard gauge railway uh, when it when it actually started but right now we've seen a change of tune perhaps it comes with his role as the infrastructure head at the african union but what do you read out of this irrespective of the loan and the grants that might be coming our way well i'd like to say of course the change of tune is good for the country and uh but for Rail as a person you know uh because he was a he was such a serious critique it portrays him as a dishonest broker. You know, when he was not in government, he was against it. Now, because he's in it, he's okay. You know, you make so st very strong statements against the, the railway and yes. all that. At some point, he said there was an inflation of 100 billion from 227 to 327. Mm -hmm. So he was talking about some guys stealing 100 billion shillings. So what has changed? So for him as a person, I think it deflates him in terms of integrity as a politician. But then again, I think it's good to see guys working together for the benefit of the country again. All right. And I think in, its inclusion in the whole thing injects some level of integrity and transparency. Does it dent Raila Odinga's credibility in as, any way as a political leader? That is it. Next time you see him criticizing something, you will tell it's because he's not in it. 
And when he gets in, he, the, the tune changes. So I, I don't expect him to actually say anything negative now that will be taken serious about uh, any project because Kenyans will say, okay, last time when you were outside, you criticized it. When you got in, you changed tune, so they won't take him seriously. So it does dent his uh, credibility as a politician, as a leader, and all that. But then the bottom line is, it is good for the country. Let's look at it. You've mentioned it's good for the country. In terms yeah. of economy right now, yeah. um, KNBS, Kenya National Bureau of Statistics, have actually said that Kenya's economy has grown by around 6.3%. Now, in terms of um, what do we call the loans and the grants and, you know, the rising debt margin we have as a country, I know infrastructure is very important in terms of expanding the economy right now. What do you think about the loan that is set to extend the railway from Naivasha to Western Kenya um, in terms of it being facilitated well enough in order to, you know, bring out the intended outcome and, uh, you know, in the long run, what we are aiming at at Vision 2030 as well? Now, when it comes to investment, you talk about returns on investment. Anytime you realize you don't get the kind of returns you expect from an investment, you stop it. Now, uh, investing in infrastructure is okay, but it has to be done in a place where the returns can be realized, especially quickly, for a struggling population like Kenya. When you talk about uh, an economic growth of 6%, you mm -hmm. know, Kenyans cannot feel that. Those are just figures, they're just numbers. Actually, Kenyans are complaining the cost of living has gone up, and we don't have enough money to support that. Mm -hmm. So the investment in this year is not prudent. Borrowing money is okay, but investing it in a place where there is no reasonable ROI is not okay. You realize this case told us uh, operational losses for this DR was around 10 billion, mm -hmm. which means it's not a prudent investment. So Kenya is struggling. You cannot borrow money and, and stretch a railway line that is not bringing any money back. So I think borrowing and investing in SDR is misguided. That is why I think in the long run, Kenyans are going, are going to suffer. So I think they need to divest the money to some other place, not extending something that is causing or leading to losses but as we wind up um even as you mentioned that um critics might argue that we're coming from a point that um the initial uh idea to have the standard gauge railway was to actually open east africa you know um even as the belt and road initiative um is actually meant to link up the three continents once uganda picks it up if they do um, it might have better return on investments um, as compared to where we are right now. I think, okay, that makes sense. In the long term, of course, it's going to be okay. But then again, what's going to happen to Kenyans in the period from now to a point where we begin realizing returns on this? We're going to have a period of intense suffering. So there are places where you can invest, where Kenyans can be able to gain something that can make their lives what bearable. Then, once you know Kenyans are doing well, you can now go ahead and invest in what? You can extend the railway line. You cannot keep Kenyans waiting for 20 years to begin realizing positive returns as All they right. suffer. Guys might not live long enough to see that. Okay. Yeah. Well, very interesting. Abdul mm -hmm. always a pleasure. Next Thank time, you. I think we'll touch on the upcoming South Africa elections. Yeah. You know, Ramaphosa on one side, EFF party on the other. Yeah. But always a pleasure to have you Thank with you. us. Thank you. Thank you.